everyone. Welcome to Risk Roundup. Irrespective of cyberspace, aqua space, geospace, space, or quantum space, human behavior can be the biggest security risk. Today, as each nation continues to undergo massive technological transformation and seek to new ways to rebuild their economies, human lives, the human ecosystem, it brings human behavior at the very center, perhaps more than ever before for our collective security. Moreover, when we evaluate the human behavior, not only on social media, but also when it comes to destructive ideas, innovation and initiatives, it is forcing us to understand the root cause, the biology, the very science of human behavior. Perhaps Neoteni can help us understand the science of human behavior. To discuss Neoteni, the science of human behavior further, I'm honored to welcome Professor John Torday to this roundup. Professor Torday is a development physiologist from UCLA with a very strong interest in how and why physiology has evolved. Welcome, Professor Torday. We are so delighted to have you on Risk Roundup. And it seems your research on neoteny, the biological aspect of human behavior, has very broad implications to risk group community. And I look forward to your thoughts on these crucial topics of science of human behavior, especially the biology that brings out the best and worst in all of us. Agreed. I hope that the message I deliver will help to understand that better, because I think it's critically important as you have so well rolled out here. So yes, thank you. Thank you for having me do this presentation. We are, we are very honored and we are delighted. If you would like to share your presentation now. Okay. Okay. So the title of the talk is How and Why We Have Evolved as Juvenile Naked Great Apes or Narcissism as the Source of Global Insecurity. Um, next slide, please. So the hypothesis is that global security begins with personal security, but has evolved, uh, but as evolved juveniles, we are in insecure by definition. So the question is, how do we cope with this seminal reality in order to attain global security? I hope that the following narrative will help in this regard because our very existence as a species depends upon it. Next. So this is the way we think about evolution. Uh, this is somewhat tongue, tongue in cheek, but um, we're real, really reasoning after the fact when we think in terms of Darwinian evolution, when in reality, there is another way to look at this process from its origins forward, which is a, a logical progression. Next. Uh, next. Why is it blank? So this is uh, Picasso's Guernica. And imagine grinding this up in a wearing blender. Um, I guess you'd have to advance. Yeah. Uh, next. Um, hmm. Next. So, yeah, so if you, blend, if you put it in a blender, next, here's my blender. And now I'm going to analyze it with a mass spectrometer. I'm going to look at its uh, atomic composition. Next. Next, please. So that won't give you the Spanish Civil War, which is the symbolism in this, in this painting. So I'm going to give you an alternative way of thinking about this. But in the context of rapid human evolution over the last 200 years, we know next that the human brain next has enlarged substantially. Um, if you could just back up, yeah, go to the previous slide, please. Okay. If you can, I can, uh, I can deal with this. Okay. So the way I'm going to suggest that we can think about this is the way that I've deconvoluted evolution through cell biology, which is not the common way of thinking about evolution. Next slide, please. So if we start on the far left with the unicellular state, which dominated the earth for the first three and a half billion years or so of the earth's existence, and we move from left to right, cell-cell communication is actually what has generated what we think of as complex physiology. In reality, it's not because we go from unicell to unicell. So the, com the complicated view of physiology really is an artifact. It is the way in which we accumulate information from the environment so that in reality, we always remain in the unicellular state. I hope you can at least keep that idea in mind as I go through this concept. Next. Okay, you're gonna have to go through. 
So, so the way that I've comp uh, compiled this information is as a pie graph in this case, and I'm starting at the top at 12 o'clock with development, showing histologic uh, evidence of embryologic development. And then as I move cl clockwise towards homeostasis, which is the driving mechanism for physiologic evolution. And then furthermore, moving to the next quadrant uh, clockwise, um, repair actually is a recapitulation of development and homeostasis. So there is one continuous process for next, the entire process, next please, of evolution. So evolution is really all, Dobchansky said in 1975, that evolution is all of biology. And I'm demonstrating that here based upon cellular molecular principles. Next slide. Another way to think about this, if you start at the bottom of this progression from uh, bottom to top as a vertical integration, I'm starting with the cell, the unicell, and the ability to mediate a calcium flux, which is really the essence of uh, physiology, at least certainly vertebrate physiology and vir virtually all physiology. And then if we move up this, the, uh, the ladder here, if you will, and we reach this point of the water land transition, this was a major step in vertebrate evolution in adaptation to land in response to the greenhouse effect about 500 million, a billion years ago um, that caused the drying up of uh, the waters to some extent to, to, uh, to expose land and then there was land adaptation. And then if you continue this progression, and I won't go through all the details, um, at every step, the relationship between calcium and the lipid membrane that forms this micelle here at the bottom is essentially the relationship between lipids and oxygen, all the way from the origins of life here in the unicell to the very uh, complicated um, or complex physiology that we exhibit. So showing here the evolution of the lung, the kidney, the adrenal gland, the pituitary in the brain. Um, and in reality, all of these steps actually uh, coincide or relate to the very origins of life all the way back here. So that everything, every step here is in reference to this original step. And the way we think about this as physiologists is as uh, homeostasis, which then becomes allostasis, which is homeostasis in this context of many different organs interacting with one another under contr the control of homeostasis. Next slide. So again, if we were all familiar with this image of uh, the evolution of human beings from um, great apes progressing through hunter gatherers and et cetera, et cetera, to humans. Um, and the major transition here is from the ability to walk, uh, to walk on two legs, bipedalism. That was critical for human evolution and the evolution of human consciousness. And that in fact was mediated by or um, uh, instigated by being warm blooded. Only mammals and birds are warm blooded um, and both sh um, share the qu this uh, capacity to um, determine their own internal body temperature, which is different from every other organism on the, um, every other species. And endothermy was critical for bipedalism. You cannot walk on two legs unless you have efficient, uh, meta, um, an efficient metabolism. And so I'm showing here the relationship between the evolution of endothermy, the evolution of bipedalism, that in turn freed the forelimbs for, in the case of birds for flight, and in our case for tool making and language. And in reality, language is another form of tool making. Um, and then there was positive selection, heavy positive selection for the central nervous system, uh, specifically the brain. And the relationship between tool making, language and the brain is really what brought civilization about. Basically the implementation of tool making to form uh, written language is the only way that civilization could have evolved. So I'm showing this vertical integration um, in that in that way of thinking. Next slide. So the integration of, um, I'm going to try and explain briefly how warm bloodedness evolved. The integration of the lung, the pituitary, pituitary gland and adrenal physiology is what constitutes warm bloodedness. So in the transition from water to land, um, vertebrates adapted to land 
but there were periods in which the, the evolution of the lung, for example, was constrained. It was not efficient enough to maintain metabolic activity. Uh, and that stress in turn triggered the pituitary in the brain here to generate adrenocorticotrophic hormone, uh, which stimulates the adrenal gland. And that in turn alleviates the uh, constraint on the lung by increasing the production of a soapy material in the alveoli where gas exchange occurs, uh, namely the production of surfactant. But as a side effect of all of this, the catecholamines that actually mediate this process, adrenaline uh, or epinephrine, um, had a, a collateral effect on fat cells in the organism, causing release of free fatty acids, which are a very efficient source of energy. And that energy was the basis for the generation of endothermy. Next slide, please. So, so here I'm showing this process. Okay, next slide. So we know that the brain increased fairly substantially over the course of human evolution, starting here at the, at the bottom and progressing um, to, the, to modern human beings. Um, and this is shown graphically here. And next slide, please. So the birth canal <clears throat> has not enlarged over the course of human evolution. To accommodate the enlarging brain or, and head, we are born relatively prematurely with only about 25% of our brain size. That is to say, we are born immaturely with a disproportionately large head, a hairless body, a small gut, a protracted childhood lasting through our mid twenties or even longer in some cases and prolonged lifespan requiring extensive nurturing of juvenile behaviors, behaviors by both the immediate family and society. Um, this uh, fostered such juvenile behaviors as risk taking, a fixation on self or narcissism and an inordinate uh, libidinal sex drive. So for example, pornography is the mainstay of the World Wide Web. Next slide, please. So I'm showing, showing schematically on the, in the top frame, the process of evolution from the singularity and the Big Bang, which is thought to have been the origins of the cosmos or the universe as we know it, giving rise to these primitive uh, so-called micelles, which are what happens when lipids are immersed in water. Um, lipids uh, are produced by pulsars in the cosmos. They're also produced by um, hydrothermal, <coughs> hydrothermal vents in the sea floor. We know that. So lipids are fairly pervasive uh, and have been pervasive um, on Earth. And when you submerge uh, lipids in water, they spontaneously form what are primitive protocells or micelles. There are these small sphere spheres composed of a semi-permeable membrane, which essentially defined the interior and exterior of living organisms. Um, David Baum, the uh, physicist, described this process uh, in his book, Wholeness and the Implicate Order, published in 1982, um, in which he said that there was an ideal order, the implicate order, but that the this generation of these micelles created an explicate order, which is what we think of as the real world. But as Baum stated, that's not correct because uh, the way we see the explicate order is through our subjective evolved senses. So that maintains our, you know, it allows us to exist within the explicate order, but it is a derivative of the ideal implicate order. Um, and in the process of um, evolving, Epi epigenetic marks are acquired in the environment and they facilitate the transition from the explicate to the implicate order. Um, and then furthermore, exaptations or the reuse of genes that had formerly been used for a different purpose as described by Stephen Jay Gould in a paper that he published back in the early eighties, these exaptations, think of them like Russian dolls are the way that emergence, the emergent properties of evolution occur. So this is all um, in, as a background to our life cycle. And the life cycle starts with the fertilized egg or zygote on the left. And then it goes, uh, gives rise to the embryo and to the offspring, to infants, toddlers, adolescents, teens, adults, male and female. And then we go into late life into, as, el as elderly members of society. Underpinning this process actually is 
are hormones, uh, particularly androgens, testosterone, and estrogens, which determine our gender, male and female. And up until the time of puberty, they remain fairly stable. But then in puberty, we see the rise in these sex hormones during teenagehood, if you will, um, in association with um, risk taking uh, as, a, as one example of uh, what teenagers do. We all recognize that we've all gone through it, I assume. Um, and so you have, have this period of risk taking. And then as we go into uh, mid, uh, mid or adult life, things stabilize. And then in um, late life, the sex hormones uh, decline, estrogens and androgens, and are replaced by oxytocin, uh, the so-called love hormone produced by the posterior pituitary. And oxytocin is, has, an, has interesting uh, features to it. Not only does it uh, facilitate the process of birth, um, uterine contraction and milk, let, milk letdown, the ability to breastfeed in, in uh, humans and, and mammals in general, um, but it also, for example, facilitated the evolution of color vision among other properties. So it has a very strong integrative effect. Um, and it, as I said, it takes over in late life from the estrogens and the androgens. And so we have a phase of life in which we're much more, we're perhaps kinder and gentler to one another um, in, in late life. That's a, um, and this process by which we go from this teenage risk-taking process, thinking we're uh, uh, emotionally older than our chronological age, uh, and then segueing into late, later life here in elderhood where we think we are younger than our chronological age is referred to as subjective age. But my point is that these hormones are actually dictating our behavior um, as a species. And that's important because basically we are, our purpose in life is to obtain information from the uh, environment and collect the, the data in order to determine whether, um, how, and uh, how the uh, environment, which is by definition changing all the time, is doing so because we have to collect information in order to inform the organism of those changes and modify our DNA epigenetically in order to maintain our equipoise with the uh, environment. Hope that wasn't too complicated, but that's the big picture idea. Next slide, please. So beware of the naked apes. Um, this is the hypothesis. In the spirit of our efforts to somehow rectify things post COVID, I'd like to share the following as a possible tipping point for a paradigm shift, bearing in mind that humanity has gone through such an advance before, uh, before such an advance before in the wake of the dark ages, giving rise to the age of reason and enlightenment as proof of principle. It has been a hypothesized that we humans are naked apes. Uh, Gould actually was the first one to suggest that in his book, Ontogeny and Phylogeny, published in uh, the mid 70s. Retaining our juvenile behaviors, as I alluded to in the previous slide, acting accordingly. So narcissism, risk-taking, precocity, sexual precocity, but without an explanation for how and why that might have occurred. On the one hand, N8 juvenility would answer many questions we have, we have about ourselves, primarily why we are the only species that is destroying the planet and, oursel and ourselves in the process. On the other hand, we have been tremendously successful in developing a civilization able to transcend our earthly existence and fly to the moon beyond and beyond, for example. So how do we reconcile this paradox? Next slide, please. Over the course of human evolution, there has been inordinate positive selection pressure for our disproportionately large heads and brains, as I expressed earlier as a consequence of standing on two legs or bipedalism. Uh, and that's based upon a paper I published in 2015 on the central theory of biology, which basically expresses that idea of the significance of warm bloodedness in giving rise to human evolution and the evolution of the forelimbs for tool making and language. So that bipedalism, instead of crawling around on all fours due to being warm blooded, affording metabolic energy for bipedalism, freeing our forelimbs to make tools, including language itself. So for example, when we formulate a sentence, we have subject, verb, object. So that uh, is a form of tool making. And that conflation of skills is what has given rise to human civilization in the sense that 
you couldn't have civilization without written language, which is the, comp the combination of tool making and language, if you will. I'm convinced of the validity of that idea based on scientific evidence. For example, the area of Broca on the underside of the cerebrum is where both tool making skills and language emanate from. For example, and that structure is unique to great apes. Cut to the chase, to answer the how and why question, we must ask why it is that we are born with only 25% of our total brain capacity, whereas other organisms are born with a full com uh, component of, uh, for a, with a fully formed brain. Unlike other species, our, uh, I hypothesize that that is because over the course of human evolution, the head uh, and brain has gotten progressively larger, as I had shown earlier, but the birth canal has not. In order to accommodate the ever enlarging head, head and brain, there was positive selection pressure for preterm birth. After all, the prematurity rate in humans is relatively stable at about 10%. And by the way, no other organism exhibits uh, preterm birth. So that indicates that it is genetically determined. We normally see prematurity as abnormal. Uh, the, whole, the entire discipline of neonatology is based upon that premise. But, before, uh, but perhaps it's not. Perhaps it's a side effect of positive selection for our enlarged brains. Next slide. So in conclusion, humans are neotenous. Uh, that is to say, they remain in a juvenile state perpetually. Civilization accommodates behaving like, uh, behaving like juveniles, as has been rec recognized by Carl Jung. He referred to this as the puer aeternus and Gould in his ontogeny and phylogeny, though Gould didn't provide a causal explanation. A good Darwinian evolution, evolutionist that he is because by acknowledging the, um, the, the fact that there was this interrelationship between our evolution and our environment, uh, we, uh, I'm sorry, we have the opportunity to promote uh, our best, uh, I was going to say that the reason that Gould didn't explain the, proper, the neotenous property is because that would suggest causation when in fact, Darwinian evolution is based upon random mutation, at least the modern synthesis of Darwinian theory is. So acknowledging the above, we have the opportunity to promote our best behaviors, such as creativity and risk-taking while subordinating our narcissistic and destructive behaviors. Promoting awareness of these inter interrelationships through education, reinforced by societal practices would lead to a healthier, more constructive society. Next slide. At any rate, the fact that we are born prematurely and that our species relies so heavily on our intelligence would hypothetically explain why we remain in a juvenile state at least until our mid twenties. And in some cases, we never really grow up thanks to society. The influence of society on what's referred to in biology as neoteny is enabling, offering an epigenetic means of protecting us and nurturing us otherwise vulnerable organisms, starting with childcare, schooling, providing a way of supporting ourselves economically, constrained by the legal system, learning about moral behavior. And of course, science, the humanities and arts offer us the opportunity to create, to create holding up a mirror to society. But I submit that with the frame of our essence as juveniles, we tend to undermine our own best interests unwittingly. But now with that foreknowledge, perhaps we can devise ways of promoting the best of our behaviors and suppress the worst in us. Perhaps we could discuss the value added in thinking along these lines. Perhaps we should contemplate the role of seniors in society, for example, why we feel younger in late life, instead of taking advantage of their wisdom that is seniors, without the stigma of sex hormones. Society warehouses us uh, seniors uh, after they are, uh, we are no longer contributory to the uh, marketplace. We don't generate a W-2. Witness the disproportionate number of seniors who have died during COVID, the COVID pandemic as a result of such practices. Younger generations should be made aware of the value added in having seniors as an extension of culture in combination with integrated knowledge of our evolution and, reinforce, and reinforcement of delayed gratification. Next slide. So to paraphrase Eisenhower's Beware the Military Industrial Complex in 1961 upon leaving office to become president of Columbia University, beware the juvenile evolutionary complex. Next slide. Next slide. 
Thank you. Question. That is very, very informative. And uh, the point that you made, Professor Torde, about 25% of brain development at the birth, is it the is it the standard like every one of us who is taking birth we have only 25 percent of the brain developed or is it relative like you know it's comparative and everyone goes through different you know 20 percent 25 percent probably 30 percent and if not if it is everyone has the same similar you know 25 percent of the brain growth when uh, brain development when uh, they are taking birth, then what determines? Because when we evaluate genes and gene expression, what determines the effects of neoteny? Is it is there some other variables that would determine how quickly or rapidly or in what time frame do the genes express so that the growth, the development of the brain happens in a timely manner? Because as you see in society, not everyone has the same maturity level at you know 20 years or 30 years or 40 years of age there is no set you know maturity timeline so even if hypothetically 25 percent is the development at birth then what are the variables that determines the development of uh, the brain further a great question um basically you know Piaget, the great child psych psychologist, he expressed this idea um, descriptively, uh, saying that you know you have to go from the breast to crawling, toddling, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and he and he his his hypothesis was that this extended childhood in humans was necessary because we have these big brains. Well, in reality, we know now that epigenetics is critically important, and so it's not merely providing the windows in which to expose the developing conceptus to various environmental cues. It's the actual cues that are being accumulated. And so the more enriched, and we know this from animal studies, the more enriched the environment, the, the, the better the brain develops within limits because it is genetically determined ultimately. But for example, Durkheim, the, the, the French sociologist, uh, the, the whole field of sociology emerged from his observations of orphan children in orphanages, orphanages, the ones that were not touched, died prematurely. So there's this clear, clearly this very important interrelationship between the developing human being and its environment. And the more enriched it is and the more free it is, the lot more likely that we, we will, we reach our maximal genetic capacity uh, in terms of our development of, you know, intellect. I think it makes sense what you are talking about because I, I read a paper, you know, after uh, we discussed uh, about the new Denny topic that what information is available. And I came across a very interesting paper. I'm not, I don't recall the author at the moment, but it was about the domestication of dogs. And I read that and it was very interesting analysis. So that made me think about it that the point that you just made about you know the free how the freedom in you know how the humans live you know the environment so i was my question is that has the domestication of humans played any role in the expression of genes that are responsible for our behavior because does that have it's important to understand if that has any role in why most humans are followers and not wanting to be leaders. You know, if we look at the entire human population, not everybody is a leader. Most of us are followers. So there are only few leaders, you know, irrespective of country or communities. So this entire analysis or the point is based on the paper that I read about the domestication of dogs and how that has determined most how why you know most of the pets have lost their ability to lead they they used to be when they were living in free world you know when they were outside and they had to hunt and they had to live on their own and survive on their own their behavior was very different so mm -hmm. has that kind of you know domestication of humans in how we live as a family and how we live as humans do you think it has played any role in the expression of genes that has shaped our behavior Absolutely. And there's no question in my mind that that's correct. And I think that we've kind of 
deviated from the optimal trajectory of um, the evolution of human society, which is essentially, so, so the way I think about that is this idea of niche construction. Um, the fact that <clears throat> organisms essentially modify their own immediate environment to optimize their evolutionary strategy. Um, the ultimate niche construction is the cell itself. So in that vein, our internal physiology is the ecological, uh, environmental, external environment. There, there's a continuum there. That's how we go from unicell all the way to Gaia, Lovelock's concept of the Earth Mother. There is a continuum there. But as you intimate, um, just the idea that we're, um, we put so much emphasis on, on um, the juvenile state, certainly in, in our society here in the, the United States. When you think about that, that has, a, has an undermining effect because you have to have a certain maturity in order to understand what's optimal for the child in terms of child rearing. If we're all gathering in the middle as juveniles, <laughs> you get this, the, the products of our society are not optimal. Um, and in fact, in the hunter-gatherer state, we were probably in a better condition to have the teachable moment to, for people to remain independent and free thinking and open-minded because the opportunity was there. But once you shrink wrap, wrap everything, including ourselves <laughs> and our foodstuffs, and we don't see, you know, one of the big, my big pet peeves is the, the lack of understanding of process. We verticalize everything, whether it's the business model or education, everything is verticalized. So we don't see that continuum and we don't appreciate the continuum and it undermines our ability to maximize our full capacity as human beings, in my opinion. No, I think it's an excellent point that you are making because we are taking everyone, you know, at the same level, you know, we are considering everybody at the same level, irrespective of whether it's education system or workplace, everywhere we are expecting that every human being, you know, every student that goes to school, they have the same maturity level, they have the same intellectual level, and we are evaluating their performance based on that. Same for, you know, workplaces. We are expecting that everybody has the same maturity level or same capability to be able to perform certain task, you know, but that it seems that that's not the case based on, you know, the emerging uh, understanding based on the neotany. And even if, you know, look at the behavior on social media, the behavior in geospace, that means when we meet other people in person, how we behave versus how we behave on social media, that is very, very different. Now, we know that social media has become very powerful. Now, on social media, if you look at, you know, the amount of information that is shared, nobody hardly, you know, anybody is ever reading the article. If you publish something, then you will see based on the name of the publication that whether it's Forbes or whether it's this or that, you know, people just start sharing it without reading it. What's the message is, whether they understand it, whether it's worth sharing it. People just share it. So on social media, how, and nobody reads what they share. And the human willingness to share content without reading or evaluating or thinking is exploited to spread disinformation. Now mm -hmm. we know that uh, social media, you know, the rumors and misinformation, disinformation, is going rampant. And you know, if you look at the, the lot of the posts, even the ones that are trending on Twitter, they are so hateful posts and they are proliferating and the outrage is in addition, you know, it's not just the post, but it's boosted by algorithms. The algorithms that these technology companies are defining and that response to the number of shares, likes and comments, or even it's just by the nature of the topic or sometimes you know who is posting it and that in all of that technology is at the center of all that there is no doubt about it because technology is providing a platform but it's the humans that their behavior the destructive behavior in what they post what they share that is horrifying so in with the understanding that we have now about neoteny and all the roles, you know, all the role that genes play and the gene expression and other variables play. What can be done to change the human behavior from the perspective of social environment? Because at the end of the day, it, 
impacts of our collective security. Absolutely. I mean, I've, I've thought a lot about this and, and you're absolutely right uh, about the undermining of the human condition by this technology. <clears throat> so for example, we know that, um, you know, we have light, right and left brain and they each have different um, agendas, if you will, um, in terms of understanding the environment. But it occurred to me that so it's called lateralization. So the left brain can, is determined by the right body side, uh, right side of the body, right brain by the left side of the body. But if you, uh, and that probably, my, my sense is that what that's doing, the differential between left and right brain, when you look at something, you consider something is quantum. <laughs> that's where the quantum com comes in. But more importantly, perhaps when we, you and I are looking at one another, if I look at, at someone real time, uh, it, when I look them in the eye, there's no right, left brain. It, we are in sync. It is very important as a human experience to have that opportunity, but in silico, it doesn't work, for example. But even the idea that I, it occurred to me because I, I Zoom with uh, educators in, in England and I said to them at one point, I think we make a systematic error in thinking that education is just an extrapolation of parenting. That's not correct. Education is education. And as you were saying, we misconstrue, we think that knowledge and information are one and the same. They're not. <laughs> you know, I, deal, I train physicians to uh, do emergency medicine for preterm newborns. I have for 50 years. And the reason I existed in that environment was as a scientist to train them how to do science, bench lab science in developmental biology, largely. So they would understand what they were doing and the implications of what they were doing real time in terms of really understanding all the way down to the, literally to the atomic level, the molecular level at least. Um, so they, in their gut, they would understand the implications of their actions. They don't do that anymore. They just have a, you know, they have this PDA, you know, they have this smartphone and if they don't have the answer to the question, they look it up. But we know that every second is lost in, the, in an emergent situation, just as in, in the ER, you're losing precious, time and physiology. It's being lost on this human being who has to live the rest of their life with this problem, if you will, physiologically. But yeah, so I think that we basically have hollowed out, you know, the process of education, the process of socialization. And we think that we can, um, um, that by doing that, it, it makes life I don't know, we can faster, cheaper, better, something like that, but it doesn't work. We're, we're not remaining faithful to the trajectory of our evolution. So the idea that we can genetically engineer is crazy. Uh, other than, you know, there are specific d diseases that probably could be alleviated, but, but to actually genetically engineer people for height and eye color, that's crazy because all those genes are inter interrelated with one another. You cannot do that. But we don't appreciate that, that phenomenon, that, that, that reality because we're still dealing with Darwinian evolution, not with the kind of stuff that I talk about, cellular evolution. So yeah, so there's a huge misconception that has to be rectified or we will, in my opinion, you know, because the, the, the um, prevailing understanding of evolution is Margulis' idea of endosymbiotic act, action, that is internalization of the external environment when you had an existential threat that put us on the same trajectory as the physical expansion of the cosmos, literally, because we're on, we're on the same carrier wave, the same vector. But once you deviate from that, you're no longer complying with the, the processes that set us in motion with regard to the first principles of physiology. We're, we're on a different, we're in the Anthropocene. This is, so now we're calling it a different thing. We're saying, oh, it's man-made. And that's, that's a, well, it's not okay. We don't understand first principles. So anyway, yeah, yes. it's a problem. Yeah. And, and I yeah. think we have, to, we have to be able to grapple with this because, because for all the attendant reasons. And, I, and I, I've said that, I mean, we've gone through this before with the, uh, you know, the, at, at the end of the dark ages, we're now in our own form of the dark ages. It wasn't as severe, but COVID. And we have opportunity to rectify, to, to assess and to rectify the, the, the way that we comport ourselves in society as individuals, as a society. And I think we must, because to, to just go back to, to try and recapitulate what we had before COVID uh, occurred, that's not going to work. <laughs> and we can't, and, and going to other planet, other Earths, it's not a strategy. All we're going to do is 
drag our, you know, our bad behaviors elsewhere. <laughs> and we just go through the same boom bust cycle that we have gone through forever. Yes, yeah. and uh, you're absolutely right. And uh, these are very concerning uh, trends that we are witnessing, especially when we think about uh, COVID-19 that we all are going through and the lockdowns that are in place in most of the countries at uh, different time frames, and how the young people and you know people of all different uh, ages, how they are able to adapt or whether they are able to adapt, that is a cause of great concern because uh, yeah, I read the news yesterday that in Japan, the number of people who have committed suicide is more than the number of people who have died because of, you know, the COVID-19. So that brings us some really serious questions to evaluate that is it, have we the humans lost our ability to adapt to different, you know, uh, adverse in our, uh, conditions? Are we not able to go through some hardships? Are we not able to accept the reality of the pandemic? Or are we, have we become society just to you know, have fun, to go party and uh, all of that? Because if you, even if you look at the consumers you know, across nations, and if you look at the companies that are coming up with commercialization, they all you know, focus on you know, bring out the inner child from, from you and you know, have fun. And having fun has become an imperative, even at the cost of responsibility and adaptability. And, Everybody is just focused on, you know, fun and partying and, you know, the reality of, you know, the way of life that many of, you know, us are used to. And the reality of today amidst the COVID-19 pandemic is very different. So based on the biological trends, where do you see the society is going? Because these are some really concerning, you know, uh, trends that we are witnessing it today. Oh, I fully agree. And, um, but, um, you know, it's, it's Pavlovian, really, because we are rewarded for entertaining ourselves. And so the serotonin mechanism is synced to this happiness kind of mentality, when in reality, it, it, it's, that's way too monolithic. It's, it's not the right way to comport ourselves. So in my way of thinking about cellular evolution, we began in an ambiguity. That is Schrodinger's negative entropy. That, that is a, the internal uh, physiology, our internal physiology is based upon negative entropy, negative energy hierarchy. Whereas in the outside external environment, it's a positive entropy. So that, that interrelationship is really the reason why we have been able to evolve because we recognize that duality and we respond accordingly. But in the interim, because we didn't understand all these things from a scientific perspective, we made up these narratives, you know, whether it's the Garden of Eden or whatever the myth is for Shintoism or other religions or even uh, nation states and how they make up their mythic um, uh, origins and how they've, you know, they, they've become these great nation states. These are all narratives that are based upon false, you know, they're, ma they're just so stories you know, they're Kipling stories. We, and as a result, we've, we've lulled ourselves into thinking that way. And we, you know, amplify that certainly with the, you know, with, with um, the electronics, the technology we have. And so we just feed back, feed back upon ourselves these feel good stories, when in reality, we're not dealing with the actual situation as it is, and dealing with it in a systematic way, which is more in accord with ultimately quantum mechanics. Every, we, all the, the scientists, the physicists in, in, in particular, acknowledge that quantum mechanics is really the basis for everything in existence. And we have to be able to figure out how our physiology interfaces with quantum mechanics because quantum computing is the, you know, this, the future of our existence. But if you have a mis mismatch, you know, you might as well use your computer for a doorstop because it's not gonna work. There's a disconnect between the actuality of uh, cause and effect and the way we think about it. There are two different realms and they don't, so for example, the human genome was published in 2001. Absolutely nothing other than some interesting forensics has come out of that because it's not about genes, it's about cells. And Paul Nurse, the Nobel laureate is publishing a book in February where he, he teased that idea up. 
we really have missed the boat on what the actual mechanism of, of evolution. It's not, it's not nucleotides, it's not DNA, it's the cell. The cell tells the DNA how to, what to do or what, how to change, not the other way around. We've gotten everything backwards. And in the process, we, you know, it's reductive, it's um, reasoning after the fact and reductio ad absurdum and on and on and on. We have to somehow come to grips with this because we cannot survive as a species because we're too, there are too many people and too few resources. Anyway, sorry. No, no, you are absolutely yeah. right. And uh, at the end of the day, we humans, we are super organisms. So it's not just about our own DNA or our own genome or our own cells that we, our human metabolism depends on, our human physiology depends on. It's also a lot of microbes in our, within our body, on our body and near our human body. All those plays a role as well. So it's a very complex science. We are an entangled species, you know. It's not just human to human entanglement. It's human to, you know, other living uh, species entanglement. And your point about quantum mechanics, quantum entanglement, it's very timely because those are the things we need to understand in depth because it's a human interaction that needs to be understood. And especially when we look at, uh, when we hear this news about, you know, humans committing suicide amidst COVID-19, when, when they give up hope about, you know, the human life, that is very, very troubling. And we do need to understand that how can we use this emerging understanding of science and how can we shape the human behavior in a way that it helps humans develop inner strength? How can they get inner strength to go through any kind of crisis? And how can they quickly adapt? And how can we improve not only our lives, but our human ecosystem so that we, our, our planet, we can survive for the you know, coming tomorrow? So what would you like to say our you know, global viewers and listeners from this perspective? Because you are an expert in you know, the understanding human physiology and human evolutionary processes at cellular level. And this is a time we do need to come up with some good solid you know, ideas in how we can shape the human society for the coming tomorrow because that is, there is no way we know that this is the last pandemic we are facing. We may face many more pandemics in the coming years. And we need to prepare the human species and we need to ensure that we develop the strength we need for our coming tomorrow. I fully agree, and um, <clears throat> I think that one of the the biggest problems is we're we're conditioned to immediate gratif gratification. That's what this juvenilization is all about. We have to learn again to uh, reward um, um, the um, non immediate gratification. You know, the 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 long the long game, if you will, um, which we used to do through the educational process, but that that's caved into, you know, to having fun. <laughs> you know, if it's too hard to do, uh, well, we don't, we're not gonna do that. But, um, I'm sorry, delayed gratification was the, word, the term I was trying to, to express. Delayed gratification is not, is, is not um, to be desired. But that's absurd because that's not the way that we, <laughs> our, um, that's that we just we, there needs needs to be a balance. It can't be one or the other. But there ha, but there's very little delayed gratification. It's mostly immediate gratification. But the other thing that I've conc I've concluded for myself, and this may sound crazy, but I I've come to the realization that you know based on Darwinian evolution, it's all about adults and how adults um, procreate and generate more offspring, and that that's the measure of, of biologic su success. That's an epiphenomenon. In reality, we go from, it's just like the Red Queen in Alice in Wonderland, who's running as fast as she can to stay in place. Um, we actually go from zygote to zygote, and that's the learning I've gained from the epigenetic research we've done, because that's really the way it works. And so in thinking about life in that way, um, I think we make a systematic error in thinking that we are material. It's all really all about energy. This was Alfred North Whitehead's process theory. And I think he was right. And so when you understand the idea of, of um, the transit of energy, starting with you know, the singularity and the Big Bang, and we're just, we're just carrying that process forward, I think it's a, 
it alleviates. So we're the only species that knows that we know, and we know that we're mortal, and that makes us neurotic. We have to understand that that's a very ad hoc material way of thinking about life. It's wrong. <laughs> and um, so I think that as we begin to, if we were to understand the, the actuality of what we're, so, so the reason I say that is because when I think of, as an embryologist about how you go from a unicellular state to two cells, four cells, 16 cells, 32 cells, et cetera, et cetera, that is also how phylogeny, speciation works, the same principle. But when you, when you do a wave, when you uh, superimpose phylogeny on ontogeny, the material forms, they fall out of the equation. What's left is the energy transfer from one cell to the other. And that's a literal process. Through cell signaling, you're generating high energy phosphates. That's actually what the, the um, underlying principle is. That's why I say, I think it's energy flow. And in understanding that, I think we, it helps us to alleviate that stress of the mortality because we recognize that we are, as Sagan used to say when he closed the, his show, you know, um, the, you know, his Cosmos show, we're, we're star stuff. We literally are star stuff. So the way that we have evolved in response to physical, the physical environment is consistent with the way that stars generate light. They burn matter starting with hydrogen and going all the way through the progression to the heaviest elements in a systematic way. And we in, in turn have ingested those, those elements to make them uh, our physiology. And that's why we, we and the cosmos are operating on the same um, operating system. <laughs> uh, consciousness is not what's between our ears. Consciousness is the mapping of our physiology onto uh, the, the cosmos itself. That's why, you know, when Krishnamurti tells us that we have to relinquish our ego in order to make that transition from us to the cosmos, ego gets in the way of that because ego is this artif artifactual way of thinking about ourselves as being material. So, you know, it gets so somewhat, you know, um, met too metaphysical, but I do think that that's correct. I think we got, right. the, we got it wrong. And we have to rectify that. Yes. Yes, I agree with you. And you're absolutely right that it is all about the energy flow. And thank you so much, Professor Torde, for participating in this conduct today. We appreciate your thoughtful insight into the science of human behavior. And our global viewers and listeners would benefit tremendously from what you had to say. And, you know, for our, especially for quoting Krishnamurti, because his uh, teachings, you know, his uh, understanding is so very much needed for today and for the struggles that we all are facing as a human species. So as a result, this risk kind of dialogue has been of service and we thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you risk. for the opportunity. Thank, thank you so much, Professor Torre. The Risk Group is a strategic security risk research platform and community. And through the Risk Roundup Initiative, Risk Group and I are on a mission to talk with a billion people, innovators, scientists, entrepreneurs, futurists, technologists, policy makers to decision makers. The reason behind this effort through the Risk Roundup Initiative is to research, review, rate, and report strategic security risk facing humanity. This collective intelligence effort is essential to understand where we need to focus on our collective security and what destructive forces we need to be mindful about. Thank you so much for being part of the conversation. Until next time, I'm Jayashree, host of Risk Roundup, signing off. See you next time. Thank you.